I'm just going to dive right into it. Here are some examples of uh, rare plants and Utah fans and some Utah fans. And I want to start by acknowledging all the people that have helped with this work. There are too many to mention. I'm sure I've missed a few, but it's been and continues to be a real ongoing collective effort. So many thanks to many people and many different entities. It's, it's really been a collective labor of love. So first, what are fens? Fens are wetlands. They are peatlands that are primarily supported by groundwater. That makes them groundwater dependent ecosystems. Fens are not bogs. The primary source of water for bogs is precipitation, primarily rain. So you get bogs in places with, um, that receive hundreds of inches of, of rain per year. That is, again, their primary source of water. So places like Ireland and the maritime provinces of Canada have bogs. Utah does not have bogs. It does not have adequate precipitation to support bogs. The second primary criteria for defining a fan is that the peatland has, that meets uh, the USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service definition of a histosol or an organic soil. It needs to have at least 40 centimeters of accumulated peat to qualify as a fin. So fins have very high conservation value. They store water and carbon. They contribute to stream base flows in drainages where they're um, associated with surface water. They the, provide habitat for fin plant species, which is the focus of this talk. And they're also ancient ecosystems because of the very slow rate of peat accumulation. Fens started forming with the recession of glaciers um, throughout the Rocky Mountains, and their timing is very much linked to that. Um, one more thing to consider is that the US Forest Service in its 2012 planning rule um, directed that groundwater dependent ecosystems, that is groundwater resources on um, national forest lands, be addressed in forest plan revisions. And this is really key because this is what provided the funding um, to do the wetland mapping that I'll be talking about in this talk. So I'm going to start with some examples of peat, just to get you all oriented to the substrates below fens. Um, peat comes in various varieties. This, the um, peat cores shown here are fibric soil material. Um, peat is essentially undecomposed or relatively de undecomposed plant material. And in fibric peat, the plant fibers are largely recognizable, as you can see with the moss fibers and the sedge roots and rhizomes. Um, this peat core on the left was taken from Alaska, but it's uh, an example of uh, fibric peat core, which is what most of Utah fens are underlying with. Um, peat also can be more decomposed. This is an example of a uh, hemic soil material or mucky peat. And these are a little bit harder for field crews to recognize because the peat is not quite as recognizable, but yet it still qualifies as peat. So all fens are underlain by peat and require 40 centimeters. Some examples of Utah fens are shown here. And one of the classifications for fens is related to um, the geomorphology or land and or landscape position. So the two basic classifications here are basin fens that occur in depressions. Um, and we hypothesize that they require a little less water. They're usually, they develop over a spring or a source of groundwater in a depression. Um, the other broad source or, or classification is uh, sloping fens. And these develop on hill slopes and are, and may require a little bit less water just because of the drainage patterns of the hill slopes. Um, and also sometimes can, um, they can, the peat can actually get influenced by local upland soils sort of moving into the peatland. An uh, example or a special type of a sloping fan is a pattern fan, which is shown in the aerial photo on the lower right. And these develop when the sort of the downslope movement of the water and the peat body itself kind of create these different patterns, which can result in uh, microtopography, that is ridges and depressions um, that can actually serve as sort of microhabitats for different plant species. So whenever we um, see a, a pattern fin, 
that sort of is an alert to be looking for, looking a little bit more carefully for some plants in the depressions and some plants on the ridges. Um, up until about 10 years ago, what we knew about Utah fens um, is sort of summarized in, in some of these quotes. In the Intermountain Flora, Crunk, Piss et al. said that um, these are partially overgrown ponds and they contain only acid bogs um, with a typical bog flora that includes sphagnum, calmia, ledum, vaccinium. The open water of these shallow lakes is usually covered by Rocky Mountain pond lily and bordered by buck bean. And then it gives a list of some of the submerged plants. So we get an idea of a very sort of boreal um, acid bog scene. Um, in 1930, the eminent Utah plant ecologist Walter Cottom said that hundreds of glacial lakes in the subalpine regions of the Uinta Mountains form the source of Utah's only acid bogs with typical acid bog flora, again, including sphagnum, minyanthes, calmia, et cetera. And then um, some of the, the uh, herbarium labels um, with site descriptions also kind of clued us in that we were in fens. This first one for Carex Lamosa, the top one, collected by those great Utah um, botanists, Tara Goodrich and Wayne Pageant, uh, says that the Carex Lamosa was collected on a quaking bog with fibric pistosol two feet deep. This is just a great tip off that this was collected in a fen. We've got two feet of peat. Um, and again, this is similar for Carex laziocarpa and the Carex Lamosa. Um, quaking bogs and wet meadows at 10,500 feet. We now know that a quaking bog is actually a floating peat mat, but these are the early descriptions that we look for. And they really sort of emphasize that the rare plants in Utah fens are, are not plants that evolved in situ on a extreme or unusual substrate. They are boreal disjunct species that were moved or, or located south during the ice ages and then contributed actually to the substrate formation of the fans that they occur in. I wanted to mention that there are no federally listed species, either threatened or endangered, that occur in Utah fans. And they're unusual plants, but their rarity, I think we, we still have to determine because we just haven't looked carefully enough for some of these species. The Sims Peak Potholes Research Natural Area is the only area that's set aside in Utah um, that includes a fen or actually a fen system. There's a number of cool wetlands in this, um, in this RNA. And in this table are listed some of the, the um, sort of fen indicator species that occur in Sims Peak potholes. Again, this is on the Ashley National Forest. Uh, you can see that most of these are not globally vulnerable. Um, because they, there's large populations of them at higher latitudes. But at state level in the Rocky Mountains, uh, most states recognize these as, as states either vulnerable or imperiled. So this, um, and also one thing to notice, these are not great wildflower displays. Most of the rare species are, it, are members of the Cyperaceae, are sedges or mosses. I wanted to um, sort of consider what, what I've described so far is sort of the acidic end of the fens, but the other extreme is at the alkali end of the pH range. So, uh, and another way of actually classifying fens depends on the chemistry of the groundwater support that supports that fen. So there are numerous sort of classification systems within the peatland literature that describe fans based on the water chemistry. And of course, Utah is bound to have some of these because of its very unusual and diverse um, geology. One example is the South Fork Rock Creek. Now this was a proposed special interest botanical area. It was not approved or established, but it, um, the initial paperwork that was done on it was a clue that it was a, an area of definite interest. And it was revisited in 2013 by a crew that was working on a groundwater dependent ecosystem inventory on the Ashley National Forest, uh, not botanists, but they did revisit it in um, 2013. It described it as um, calcareous, a calcareous fen 
uh, in the original paperwork, it was described as a calcareous bog. Um, but it's been noted that the pH has, is frequently over eight. So this is definitely on the very alkaline end of the, of the pH range. And the species that are listed here, the cobrisia and the club mosses are known to occur on uh, more calcareous, in, in calcareous environments. So I think, or I um, hypothesize that there are many more cal calcareous fens in Utah, but to date, we only know of this one and, and it definitely needs to be botanized more thoroughly. The fen system that has been most studied to date occurs also on the Ashley National Forest in Reeder Creek Basin. And this was studied by a group of researchers from Weber State, um, Matthew Jasik et al, some of his students um, in the early 2000s. And they were primarily focused on the physical and hydrologic properties of this entire watershed, really, of the fence system. Um, but they described in their work a sloping pattern fan, which is the um, circle targeted area on the slide. Uh, their description of the plant communities here were that this was a pattern fan, so it has those ridges and depressions that I mentioned. Um, on the ridges, the ridges were dominated by Cerex planifolia. Uh, this Cerex salix planifolia has turned out to be the most common willow observed in fans of the Rocky Mountains. It, it, it occurs in other uh, areas too, in other wetland areas and riparian areas, alpine, subalpine, but it is frequently associated with fens. Um, in the depressions, the dominant species were Carex aquatilis, Carex limosa, and Eriophrum angustifolium. Uh, other fan species included Eleocris, uh, Quincoflora, and Carex saxatilis, which are the Eleocris and the Carex saxatilis are really um, have very strong fidelity to fans throughout the Rocky Mountains. They're, if you find those species, you can be pretty assured that you're on a fan. Some of the other information that was collected in this complex, and you can see that that it's mapped over the uh, geology map showing that it occurs on quaternary deposits, that is glacial deposits. Um, in, this, in the sloping pattern fan at the bottom, the maximum peat thickness was 1.16 meters with a basal peat date of a little over 3,000 years. But in one of the deeper basin fans in this complex, the peat thickness was um, 2.4 meters and the basal peat date was 8,000 800 years old. So um, this is the only peat date, basal peat date that I'm aware of for Utah. And it shows that it kind of um, indicates that the, the peat started accumulating with the uh, recession of the glaciers uh, almost 9,000 years ago. The peat in, in these complexes is largely sedge dominated. So it's very fibric peat like the core that I showed in, um, early on in the presentation. And the fan water pH ranged from 5.5 to 7.5. So this indicates to me that, that there are multiple groundwater sources that, uh, and that groundwater is probably moving through multiple different kinds of rocks, which frequently occurs in these glacial deposits. So now I'm going to move forth um, with describing a project that I've been involved uh, with for the last five years or so. This is um, something that Johnny Proctor initiated with. It was kind of a coup. Um, it was in response to that uh, 2012 planning rule, Forest Service planning rule that I mentioned. We were able to convince leadership in Region 4 that in order to comply with that, in order to really assess the distribution and condition of their groundwater dependent ecosystems, particularly their wetlands, springs and wetlands, um, they needed to map the fence. And so we were able to obtain funding and move forward with the Colorado Natural Heritage Program to, match fen, to map fens on Utah National Forests. And, the, um, and I wanna also acknowledge here the great people at the Colorado Natural Heritage Program that did this work. Joanna Lemley, um, Gabrielle Smith, and, and um, Karen Decker, who all contributed and continue to with this work. This is really their work. So the initial, their first step is that they begin with the National Wetland Inventory Base Layer. 
Um, the, this is an outdated layer that um, that really that needs a lot of work. So it's great to be improved on, um, but it's still the baseline, the, the very base that people start with when they um, work on wetlands. And the two types of wetlands are were our palestrin emergent and palestrin scrub shrub. And these were selected because they are the most common wetland types that classify as fins. The next step is that the potential fin polygons are drawn, hand-drawn, and each one of these polygons is attributed with a confidence level. Whether it's a likely fin, that's the highest confidence uh, possible fin or a low confidence fin. And just um, a note is that within these wetland complexes that are mapped, if any portion of the wetland complex classifies as a fan, the entire complex can be considered a fan. To date, fan mapping has been completed for eight of the Region 412 forests. The only one remaining in Utah is the Uinta Wasatch Cache. These are some of the, the types of results that have occurred from this mapping effort. Each forest gets a very nice, concise report that summarizes the count of wetlands in the different categories, the acreage, and then the average size. And these are also in these reports stratified by elevation and underlying geology. So it's a tremendous resource. And you'll just, um, I wanna draw your attention to the range of numbers. Most of Utah's fans so far are in the Ashley National Forest, but there are fans on other forests. You've got so about again, a pro Kate, you have a minute left, Kate. Oh, goodness. Okay. All right. Well, the, <laughs> I'm very far behind then. I'm going to I'm going to need more time. Um, but we found that most fans occur in high elevation glaciated terrain. And also the, the other mapping product is that the number of fans are summarized by watershed. And again, contrast with the Mount T. LaSalle National Forest. Um, I've been involved in the validation and error estimation for fin rankings. What this entails is essentially ground truthing these wetland polygons by coring soils. This is work we did in 2019 on the Dixie National Forest. We focused on that targeted range on the Escalante Ranger District. That's us coring fins. And again, a closer look. Um, these are wetland polygons. We visited each one of these. The ones shown in yellow, we determined were not fans, the two green ones were. And the highlight of this is that at this one fan, which we named Dixie Fan, we um, identified Carex limosa and Minianthes um, trifoliatus, so bucking. And previously to this, these species had only been collected from the Uintas. So one of our efforts was to, that I wanted, that Johnny Proctor and I were hoping to work with was to combine groundwater dependent ecosystem inventories with rare plant surveys. We have found that while fins are common, the fins supporting rare plants are rare. So this is one of our overriding questions. And then an invitation to all of you, now that we know where a lot of these fins are, I invite you all to help botanize them. We need a lot more information on the distribution of fin plants. Um, I suspect there's some and obligate species or indicator species that are unknown from Utah, but occur in Utah, and then there are certain range extensions. So sorry to go over. <laughs>